Professor Giuseppe Bianco uh, teaches, currently teaches at the Università Cafascari Venezia, correct? Very good. Um, my Italian is not polished, I'm just going to say. Um, let's say non-existent. There we go. And um, he has um, known Professor Bianco for some time. He's done a lot of extremely interesting research in uh, 20th century French philosophy, uh, various sorts, especially on G. Deleuze and, and others. Um, he's also sort of worked in and around sort of sociological methods um, for thinking about philosophy as an institution and a practice. And it's in that latter vein um, that we're going to actually sort of see some of the work today is going to bear on that. Uh, prior to sort of his taking up his post in Venice, he got his PhD from the University of Lille in France. And he, I think before that, you have some degrees from Perry Wheat as well. A master's. A master's. Um, and has taught in a number of places, um, taught in the United States, Canada, let's see, Belgium, Brazil, Precarity. France, <laughs> all kinds of places, he's been all over the place, um, but is now in Venice and permanently. Yep. Yep. So, so this is wonderful. And today he is going to speak to us on the subject of global philosophy, question mark, um, the first International Congresses of Philosophy, 1900 to 1948. And I'd like to ask all of you to, you know, join me in welcoming Professor Bianco. Okay. Yeah, I'm visible. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, most of all, Ed, uh, for this invitation, for the warm welcoming. Uh, you remember today that I missed coming here probably in 2017, so it's good to finally have the pleasure to visit and to see the place where you had been spending the last 13 years <laughs> teaching. So it's, it's good, it's good, it's good. So uh, Ed explained well what I did before, so I was a very classical, let's say, uh, a historian of philosophy of French thought from the 20th century. Then I went to the 19th century, and then I looked a little bit of the interaction between the German philosophy and the French philosophy. Uh, and then I got fed up a little bit of French philosophy, and I tried to do something else. And I met people that were a little bit sociologists, historians. So it kind of uh, it got out of the philosophical bubble. So let's say philosophers studying philosophy from a philosophical point of view. Uh, so I tend right now in the project that I'm working on to do much more of factual uh, sociology of knowledge. So actually, as Ed explained uh, just a few minutes ago, how institutions, programs, curricula, uh, good. And, uh, and all these dev devices uh, um, shaped, in a way, the way in which we do philosophy, or as well, how philosophy is done in very, very different ways in different corners of the earth. So that was the provocation in global philosophy. There's no global philosophy. And so <clears throat> I took the case study of the uh, international, or uh, now they are called World Congresses of Philosophy. Uh, they're still going on. There's one in Rome uh, this year. But if they ever play the role, uh, an important role, they do not play this role anymore. It's just uh, kind of fair. So my talk will be uh, of these meetings about being fairs in which people actually don't understand each other. But it was a dream of both internationalism, of uh, building a kind of international umbrella where people could dialogue. They could build together, um, let's say, an encyclopedical organization of knowledge uh, under the banner of philosophy. So how people were able actually to communicate, or they wanted to do that, to communicate and to build together uh, uh, as well like a word educational system based on this very weird thing that we call philosophy, that we give for granted, but it's a very uh, weird uh, type of uh, uh, practice, practice of knowledge. 
So I, I just started, and, and it's a very long project, and God bless the European Union that provided me money to <laughs> not having to teach. And so I spent a year uh, in, in, in Quebec, in Montreal, where actually I'm taking advantage of a unit that is more a unit working on quantitative sociology. So I'm, I'm working on the proceedings of these congresses and to see as well who were, what were the attributes, as the sociologists say, call them, so the properties of the people that were presenting at these conferences, of, at these congresses. Of course, you have a very limited number of women. <laughs> you have a very limited number of extra Europeans. You have the North Americans coming in the third or fourth Congress. Uh, and then there's a lexicometric aspect of this, uh, which consists in looking through uh, there's a guy that is supposed to help me doing that. The number of words, lemmas, terms occurring in this, uh, in this uh, probably, uh, I would say, 50,000 50, pages. So it's just the first 10 Congresses. It goes from the beginning of the century until the Second World War. And so we were, had been chatting with with Ed today, and it's done. Uh, I, I took this 10 because it gives me a way to enter in the first years uh, before the first war, in which you have these very naive dreams of uh, internationalism, pacifism, and so on, that everything falls apart. And then you have the interwar, which is a very complicated period for the reasons that you can imagine. And then you have the, the let's say, the closures, in which as well uh, uh, there is an institutional um, analysis of the way in which these congresses uh, interacted with international organizations such as the UNESCO. The UNESCO emerges after the Second World War and has a link and tries to use philosophy as a kind of device for peace, but doesn't work. So I stop there, but it's, there are a lot of many things. I wrote a lot during this last year. It was a pleasure to have having the time to just do that, and I will have to work more. But today I wanted to present to you something more schematic, let's say, about the what I call the recurrent patterns of these congresses. So what is in common, what happens, what are the uh, things that happen that as well look alike the other congresses in uh, other scientific disciplines. And, and how, as well, the ambitions and the dreams uh, of the organizers uh, kind of fall apart for reasons of impossibility of communication, reasons of uh, dealing with prejudices, reasons dealing with the uh, perception, unconscious perception of their disciplines, and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to uh, kind of simplify a lot and maybe in the um, in the Q&A, if you have doubts as well, as well about the language that I'm using, I'm maybe using uh, everyday terms, but they have a, a signification in, for instance, in sociology of knowledge, you just ask me and we can discuss it. So the first thing that we have to learn, to, to keep in mind that these uh, congresses are in a way the last uh, the philosophy is the last discipline to organize congresses, uh, international congresses, which is very weird. So this as well, this way of discussing and meeting face-to-face uh, -face between different nationalities is something that emerges in the middle of the 19th century. It didn't exist before. People were traveling, for instance, to a learned academy, or they were invited to give a short lecture. Uh, it was very difficult, of course, to travel. It was very difficult to learn another language because there was no Latin, there was no lingua franca, there was no common language. Uh, therefore, uh, it's an experiment. The, the form of the Congress that is, uh, emerges at the beginning of the uh, uh, 19th century. And philosophy is the last one. For many reasons, it, surprisingly, you have before congresses in statistics, in the natural sciences, in psychology, in sociology, uh, in many topics as well. Religion and philosophy is one of the last ones. And there are many reasons to explain that, but more or less, I will give you, provide like a very simple reason is that the, during the 19th century, all the disciplines, uh, let's say, 
they take lines of flight, to use an expression that you would like, or they get their independence. And so this thing called philosophy, we don't know anymore what it is. And congresses are ways as well for the disciplines, so this form of organization of knowledge, to gain independence, to see we do exist. Look, we have a congress. And even nowadays, I think that there are many word congresses of weird uh, practice because they want to be uh, uh, recognized uh, by the state that funds them, by their peers, by the other disciplines, and so on and so forth. So I will not enumerate the, the or I will briefly do that. There are 10, I said, between 19 and, uh, and 48, uh, 19, 94, 19, 8, 19, 11. Then there's a stop because of the war, of course, the First World War. And then you have uh, five orders in the interwar. And then 48, it's in Brussels, the first, the last co uh, Congress that I will study. So I, I was telling you about the dreams of internationalism. And if you look at the first papers that are uh, uh, given in the first Congress in Paris that took place when there was this World Fair, so huge uh, event where people from all over the world were presenting their products, their technical devices, bragging about how great the nation was, and so on and so forth. There were many congresses of, of uh, disciplines, uh, scientific disciplines, and the, there's the first one of philosophy organized by a group of French uh, scholars. So that's the reason why I started this path, because I started, in a way, I studied in France, I studied French scholars and philosophers, and I stumbled in this attempt made by the French to organize these uh, congresses for many reasons. That first reason is that there was a huge uh, competition in between Germany and France, uh, uh, scientifically, but as well uh, nationally. So France wanted to show that uh, this small group of people was able to gather through a network many other uh, uh, delegates to organize this uh, congress of five days, if I remember well. So the big guy that gave the first talk was this guy. I will name drop some people. You don't. It's not important to remember the names, but uh, now forgotten philosopher Emile Boutroux uh, was saying that uh, finally there was a time in which uh, uh, after the consciousness of the family, the consciousness of the nation, there will be a consciousness of the world itself, and that will be produced by these people, kind of diplomats of the spirit, of the esprit in French, so the mind, that will be the, uh, uh, the philosophers gathered together. And uh, the task was the one of unity and totalization. So uh, being able all together to synthesize the products of the sciences, the different disciplines, and give a kind of unity through this thing of uh, philo uh, called philosophy. So uh, it was the organization and uh, synthetic attempt to keep all the science together. And so uh, the condition to do that is was the exactly the work of, I quote uh, this old man, uh, Emile Boutroux, men of all countries gather to exchange their knowledge and to complete each other by forming, I quote again, a whole, at the same time complete as much as it possible and assimilable for philosophy. So big, big dreams of uh, creating what he calls to be the universal mind or the universal spirit. So of course, this didn't happen. It miserably failed, even if there was a communication. But it's good to, to know why, what kind of worked, and what completely failed, and by isolating what I call patterns. And this pattern is common between philosophy and the other uh, disciplines, in a way, even if it may, may sound uh, surprising. And so there are three, basically, that I isolated. The first attempt is an attempt to, standard, to, to create a standard of practices and exchange the, uh, optimize the exchange of data. So the congresses were places where people were trying to communicate for what reason, to understand each other, to create 
a kind of uh, way to actually understand each other and exchange information. The second feature is a, a relation or link between the exchange of information or of data and the exchange of goods, both symbolic goods but as well material goods. So I remembered five uh, minutes ago that first congresses you had the word fair and you had as well the congress. So there's a kind of link in between the two. And the last uh, feature is the uh, conflictual context. So in this exchange, it's not flat. People actually uh, get into struggles, controversy. They don't understand each other. They try to uh, put forward either their group or uh, their cluster or their research program or their own work. So I will briefly mention one of this, uh, uh, some cases that will fall in this free, uh, in this free recurrent teams. So standardization, uh, exchange of goods and exchange of symbolic goods and conflicts. So the first uh, is the fact that, for instance, <coughs> during the first uh, four Congresses of Philosophy, there's a figure, once again, the name is not important, it's called Coutura that is a French uh, logician that had a correspondence with Russell, English uh, philosopher, that tries all his best to promote uh, uh, artificial language. First is a language called Ido, then it's Esperanto, and so on and so forth. There were congresses of these artificial languages because he wanted all price to uh, impose a way to uh, appease the conflicts, and he was convinced that having a common language would avoid as well, was a, was a path through pacifism. And ironically, he died before the beginning, I mean, at the beginning of the First World War, just uh, 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 smashed by an ambulance in Paris. So it's very funny. So that's the first, the first aspect, uh, funny or ironic. And the other aspect concerning the attempt to, to create a standard, is the fact that um, during this period, uh, you have many attempts of creating uh, uh, lexicographies, or let's say, uh, to put it simply, vocabularies. So uh, I, don't, I don't, don't know in, in the States what kind of vocabulary or the philosophical terms are, is used today, but it was a big thing when I was a student. You have a very famous one in France. You have a famous one in Italy, in which you just go ahead. You have Abelard, and then you have Nietzsche, and then you have Z. I don't know what would be Z. So you have all the terms. So this is the way, as well, to establish what belongs to philosophy and what does not belong to philosophy. For instance, I know transcendental. You look at T. You have the vocabulary. And so you have three or four of these attempts, and there is the, the attempt as well of uh, creating a common history of philosophy with many collaborators from different uh, nationalities that, of course, was excluding uh, philosophy from, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Eastern than Moscow, <laughs> or, and philosophy Southern than uh, Palermo, I don't know, to put it bluntly. So it was a process of exclusion and inclusion. Um, and as well, I said, uh, it's a, a, a place where ex there was a kind of exchange of data. Uh, for instance, the French philosopher uh, uh, Henri Bergson, uh, in the fourth congress of Bologna, he met uh, um, a scientist, a French scientist, Langevin, that was uh, on which the theories of Einstein were based. And so he learned a lot from him, and it's because of that he discussed the theory of relativity. As well, Russell uh, met Cantor, a uh, German uh, mathematician, and he got to know what was happening in Germany. So it was not only a place of uh, conflicts and missed misunderstandings, but as well a way in which people got together. Um, but the, the problem is that in this uh, controversies, um, it was much more difficult to understand each other than in other disciplines. Because in philosophy, more uh, uh, particularly, uh, each, uh, because of the 
the culture, but especially uh, the educational system, the kind of conceptual baggage, everyone had an idea of what was philosophy. So there were many conflicts and people were not understanding each other. So he called um, uh, this problem is the problem of styles of thinking. So the styles of thinking were uh, vehiculated, they passed through the speeches, the, the lectures, but sometimes they were not understood because of the mindset of the uh, delegates. Um, and then as well, it's very important because uh, probably today it's difficult to understand that for, for us, I mean me, my colleagues uh, that went to, uh, not in my case, I went just one to, oh, this for me was a huge conference, it's called SPEP. Uh, you go, Ed goes very often. And I was astonished by the fact of, uh, okay, there was one language, there was English that nowadays is the, um, for the good or for the bad, is the lingua franca in, in science. But there were so many people and it was impossible to follow everything and it was like a fair and so on and so forth. But we have to imagine in 1904, people were traveling by train and they were hearing people blabbing in Spanish, Italian, German. Uh, it was a completely new environment. So it was as well uh, a situation in which uh, people get uh, uh, fascinated for the first time listening, actually. The radio was very uh, basic. They were listening to a, someone of whom they read a text with their real voice in their real language. So there was a way of, in which as well people were able to capture the attention and to be able to uh, willy-nilly to, to, uh, to uh, impose their work. So he said the second uh, feature was the one of the exchange of goods, exchange of uh, information. I will go very quickly, but uh, the first uh, po important point is the fact, as I said, that uh, international award fairs and award congresses uh, uh, were uh, uh, having place at the same time, but as well people were bringing books, so the editors were coming and saying, so for instance you have many anecdotes of the French going to Heidelberg in 1908 and uh, uh, finding uh, hundreds and hundreds of books of the publishing houses of uh, the, the German Federation, because you had many centers, you had uh, Heidelberg, you had uh, Berlin, you had uh, Göttingen, you, so many publishing houses, and they were coming with their miserable little collection of the one publishing houses in philosophy. So there was this kind of fight also in the production. And so this is the reason why for many people, many um, philosophers, uh, this was kind of grotesque. So th there's this guy that I mentioned, Coutura, that says uh, it's just a déballage de système. It's the kind of exposition of systems as it was a fair. Another one was calling uh, fairs of philosophy. So uh, there's, a, there's this link actually between uh, 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 ideas and cultural goods or symbolic goods. And uh, mm, finally, uh, the third feature is the one of the conflicts or the controversies. And the conflicts and the, the controversies are likely to be studied from many points of view using the instrument of sociology of knowledge. But you always have to keep in mind two elements. The fact that, of course, the controversies are taking place between people that speak different languages, that don't, do, know, do not know very well the culture of the, uh, the country or the, the, of the other competitor, but as well um, that what seems to be at the first sight as a fight between um, uh, philosophers or uh, delegates from different nationalities are actually, as it was uh, uh, a squash, uh, uh, as they were playing squash, so your, uh, your, uh, your enemy, in a way, is just used as a wall, because if I'm French and presenting something and I enter into a controversy with the German, actually, 
I'm not arguing against him. I'm arguing against my French colleagues. So most of the time, all these controversies are controversies that are symptoms of what happens in the philosophical, in sociological language, what happens in the philosophical field of a nation. So you have to take in mind, taking uh, in mind that, keep in mind, sorry, that um, first of all, the strategy and the market, it's an internal market uh, of one country. So the, the idea of a field is this, that a discipline builds up from a national space. So for instance as well, the, um, the conflicts between uh, clusters, I, I use this word, but let's say groups of people that could be part of uh, um, a learned society, but most of all, they were gathering under the banner of a journal. So journals are the, 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 the very big thing of scientific communication starting from the second part of the 19th century. So we keep, we give for granted nowadays that we have magazines, journals, and so on and so, on, so forth, but scholarly journals were a new thing in, <coughs> in Europe, in the world, in journal at that point, and so journals, uh, scholarly journals were as well the places in which these clusters could emerge. So, for instance, uh, an important one in France uh, where all the organizers of the congresses were part of is this journal called Journal of Metaphysics and Morals or Ethics, Revue de Metaphysique et de Morale. And so it's very important to see how they were playing both the role of the organizers, but as well uh, the, 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 the individuals part of this cluster were fighting in different ways with different other clusters, especially German, trying either to co-opt some of them or to uh, work with other clusters. For instance, there's another uh, journal, important journal, uh, uh, Italian for the beginning of the century that was called science, scientia in, in Latin that emerged at the same time. So they get together to fight against, uh, 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 to fight against the, uh, uh, the, some of the German ones. So what is weird for the Germans is that uh, at that point it's very strange. So I, I didn't get yet to the really quantitative uh, with numbers and graphs and so on of the research, but it uh, 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 strikes you to see all the big philosophers that were very big at the time, that now we've forgotten their importance uh, in Germany, people, neo-Kantian people such as Windelband, Rickert, people uh, that we probably do not study when we do undergrad studies in philosophy, but they were very important people they basically did not give a damn about these congresses because they were already at the center. So you were not supposed, you, you didn't have any interest to go there and, 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 and dance for your supper. <laughs> Very nice uh, American expression. Uh, whereas the French were there because they wanted to, uh, to show, especially not in front of the, their international colleagues, they were good, but in front of the national authorities. So they had the interest to show in front of the ministry, uh, minister of education, in front of the mayor of Paris, in front of the president, that philosophy was important, their group was important, so they had to ha you had to have the reforms and so on and so forth. It's, it's very, uh, um, it's not rocket sciences, uh, science, but applied to what happens in the first 40 uh, years of the 20th century. This perspective gives you a way to understand uh, <coughs> the movement. And so in, in some cases, you have as well a scatter scenario where you have, uh, for instance, several uh, uh, clusters in the same nation, the same country. <coughs> I'm sorry, that are trying to build bridges with other clusters. For instance, Italy uh, was a nation that was very young. Uh, at the time, it had only 40 years of existence, much different than France. So you had a very different, uh, uh, all the, the big cities in Italy had a very different tradition. So Naples was a very big, had a very big tradition 
of uh, absolute, absolute idealism, historicism. So the Hegelian school was very strong. Whereas in the north, uh, Turin, and as well in the center, Florence, uh, for reasons that I cannot go deep in, into, were more um, fascinated or uh, were putting forward uh, programs of philosophy that were closer to positivism, closer to uh, an idea of philosophy as a kind of uh, study of the products of the sciences, but it, not a discipline is able to think the absolute. So the, all these groups were building collaborations or they were trying to have the, the international legitimation from the exterior to be, to look important to the national authorities. So the point is that, that we also have to think uh, of the international as a way to legitimize yourself in your nation. So if you, um, if you're recognized by, uh, or if you seek and you obtain recognition by some of your peers from outside, actually it's because you want to be recognized by your peers and the authorities, so the political field and sociological lingo inside your, uh, your country. So this is very, I, I went very fast, but, um, let's go very quickly, um, let's say 10 more minutes, uh, so we have time to, uh, to discuss more uh, uh, casually uh, after that. So why didn't, didn't it work? Um, or what, what works? I, 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 I spent some words saying why it was kind of useful. So how ideas were able to circulate and semi be understood, um, but basically didn't work. Uh, I, I think with my research funds, I will go to actually to do ethnology at, uh, in Rome in, in August with probably 40 degrees, whereas I <laughs> could be at the beach to see how it works. But I just look at the program you have, I don't know, 40 panels, I uh, know I'm exaggerating, like 10 panels a day, and then you have the receptions, as back in the days, the receptions, the, the whole uh, drinking a flute of Prosecco or Champagne in front of the authorities, the way as well to legitimize, but it will, it will be funny. But of course, nothing really will, nothing uh, overwhelming will happen in philosophical terms, except probably, you see, a colleague, you have a, uh, you have dinner together, you chat in the corridor, classic interaction. But let's say it didn't, it didn't work. At the beginning, it worked. The first two, the first one in, in Paris the, uh, in 19, the one in 1904 uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, kind of worked. Um, I'm always basing myself on the reviews, the feedbacks of the people who were there, they were writing in the journals. So for instance, <clears throat> there's one, we don't care about the name, Etienne Blum, and uh, uh, speak about the Congress in Geneva as a great success. There was a uh, philosophical quasi-unanimity. There was a common doctrine, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as well, the even more, the first one in Paris was a great success for the uh, reviewers, especially the French. And uh, why, why this reason? So the first one is the linguistic uniformity. Basically, 70% of the people there were speaking French. And uh, the first conference, uh, Congress in Paris, uh, you have to wait two days to have someone speaking in another language that is not French. Uh, that probably was not understood. Uh, so a German uh, scholar was very difficultly comprehensible to French because you have to think that French was a common language of the scholarly world in the 18th century. So even the Germans were speaking French, but the, the, the French had no idea of this weird language it was German. So, okay, it was a great success because it was all monopolized by the French and the French speaking uh, Swiss. Uh, and there was another element that is the, say, the nature of what I call the symbolic goods. So at this conference, the, uh, the, the, the first and the second Congress, you had a lot of mathematicians and a lot of philosophers that were um, discussing mathematical problems. You had 
Italian mathematician Peano, you had Cantor from Germany, you had many philosophers. And of course, uh, in mathematics, uh, mathematics is a discipline in which the controversy is kind of, uh, you can get along with it. Whereas philosophy, everyone has a different point of view, different set of references, and so on and so forth. Of course, when you arrive at the third congress in Heidelberg, uh, and the few f French people took the train to go choo -choo, uh, in Heidelberg, and you see all these Germans, very rigorous uh, uh, neo-Kantian philosophers that had a training in mathematics, uh, uh, natural sciences, and so on and so forth, whereas the Frenchies were uh, not very good. Uh, and you had like 60% uh, uh, of 50% of, of Germans and the rest a mixed bunch of Italians and Spanish and 30% of French. This is a kind of disaster. So everyone, you had, uh, I went through this very funny uh, reviews of what happens. And even the French say, they say, oh, there's something not working. Uh, no one is listening. Uh, there's a very uh, nice passage that I stuck into my mind. They say, everyone is clapping the Italians because it's such a, a musical language. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's that superficial. It's that superficial. So, but it doesn't work. It doesn't completely doesn't work. And it gets worse and worse. So the, the fourth one uh, um, uh, takes place in Bologna, in Italy, uh, with like very big like, philosophers like uh, Bexon, that maybe many of you know. Um, you had uh, the, the godfather of sociology, Emile Durkheim, uh, and so on. But the Germans were like, <laughs> and uh, they were not coming. And as well, looking at the um, uh, feedbacks of the uh, Americans, because there was the, the, that period was the period late uh, 19th century, begin, beginning of the uh, 20th century, in which, all, in which you had uh, uh, dozens and dozens of Americans and uh, people from uh, North America going to Germany to get trained with, uh, in laboratories of psychology, Wundt, to study philology, and then they brought back a system that looks a little bit more, we discussed today, minor, major, these things do not exist in France nor Italy, it's really a model that's kind of uh, negotiated with, with, with the German model, which is holistical. And, and so there's one of these, uh, Fullerton says that uh, in his trips to Germany, everyone uh, that he interviewed said that actually this form of the Congress was not good and then Germany didn't need it uh, because it was a kind of center. It's, if you think about the production of knowledge uh, uh, under this, the very basic schema that we can discuss of the center and periphery, Germany was at the center for physiology, philosophy, physics, and so on and so forth. So it didn't work. Um, and uh, uh, as well, all the attempts of creating a neutral or a artificial language such as Peranto and so on didn't work. The poor Coutura, as I told in the anecdote, was killed by the ambulance, a pacifist, and so on. Of course, you can imagine things will go much western, uh, much worse uh, during the 30s, especially in Germany, for uh, other reasons. Um, and so people try to find ways to cope with these uh, problems, um, uh, but all the solutions do not work because uh, basically the there were three principles of the of the first congresses. Uh, the fact that one could speak his or her own language, the fact that everyone could pick uh, a topic, and the fact that uh, um, uh, basically, basi let's say, basically two, but it, it, it's the principle of democracy and freedom. But this principle was going against the fact that there were more and more and more and more and more delegates and more and more talks and more and more languages. So uh, all the attempts of uh, restricting a little bit, uh, choosing a topic was going against the principle of freedom and democracy in the exchange of ideas, so it didn't work. So more and more uh, things uh, got worse and if uh, 
uh, if at the beginning in the reviews of the first conference, congresses uh, they say there was a kind of a university in the communication, then you see appearing in the reviews words like cacophony and just noise and boredom and, and so on and so forth. So it didn't work. And even worse, uh, it didn't work um, because uh, towards the, um, let's say, during the, uh, the, the end, of, say, 1908, 1909, um, or to put it on the, on the bigger scale, let's say, at the, um, at the turning of the 20th century, uh, in both the sciences and in philosophy, uh, you have slightly the introduction or the um, of a kind of uh, I would say epistemological nationalism. So all the nations were not only um, trying to promote their uh, scholars, uh, their uh, programs, their intellectual, and so on and so forth, um, but as well they were trying to do. Um, something that I call the uh, nationalization of the universal. So it's not only saying we are the best, but actually saying what had been done in our philosophical or scientific tradition, it's closer to democracy, uh, universalism, etc., uh, etc. Et and so uh, the years before the First War, you see that appearing. So people try to promote their uh, national tradition, which is a new word. For instance, you cannot find uh, before 1850 uh, just the lemma uh, German philosophy so, or French philosophy. It's more philosophy in France, philosophy in Germany. And I do a lot of, I play a lot with the instrument of Google that most of you know is Ingram Viewer, uh, just seeing the percentage of occurrences of a certain uh, lemma, and, and you see the, 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 the graph going up, especially uh, towards 1914, uh, uh, four, so beginning of the First World War. And so what is funny is that you, at the last co Congress, uh, you see this appearing uh, slowly, and uh, uh, what happens is that uh, a few, uh, few years later, uh, you would have, both in France and in Germany, uh, intellectuals such as uh, Bergson in France, Durkheim, like big, important uh, scholars that engage in the propaganda of war, saying uh, Germany is, uh, 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 it's a barbaric culture, uh, it's, uh, he wants to colonize us and so on. You can think about something happening today, but I will not get into it. Um, uh, so, and, and we, the French, are the guardians. We, the country of uh, René Descartes, we are the country of the universal and blah, blah, blah. So you really have pamphlets of, they are despicable, of propaganda war, and that happens the same way. In Germany, you have big guys like such as uh, Wundt, uh, Winderband, uh, and so on, and they really sign <coughs> uh, a big uh, pamphlet today uh, that I forgot. Schrift auf Ruf in the. I will, I will let it go because my German is despicable. But in in a way that happens as well in Germany. So you see at what point um, what happens in this Congress is, is this attempt on one hand of. Uh, uh, of promoting communication, diplomacy that will happen as well in the uh, interwar period, interbellum, uh, pacifism, uh, universalism, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, this has a kind of bad faith aspect, and you have as well uh, the emergence of both nationalistic uh, ideas, but as well of particularistic idea. That would go much worse as well. Uh, of course, if you can imagine, during the 30s, uh, I was mentioning this, the, guy, <coughs> the, the, the case of the, uh, the last Congress before Second World War that took place in, in Paris for the second time, uh, and where 
important German philosophers who were absent, such as Heidegger. Uh, but because Heidegger, in a way, was too progressive. <laughs> I mean, Heidegger was also <laughs> compromised with, uh, with the Third Reich and so on. So the Third Reich was controlling who was coming to, to Paris. There were just three very weird uh, peripheric uh, philosophers that uh, started uh, 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 their talks and ended their talks with Nazi salutation. So all this to say to what extent there were dreams of universalism, especially in disciplines such as philosophy, that is, push uh, or push or push us today even to think uh, 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 from from the skies and actually how these dreams kind of crash completely facing uh, the geopolitical uh, but as well the the politics of knowledge during this first uh, uh, 50 years of the uh, 20th century. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm impressed by uh, your talk about this historical event. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it seems your talk didn't refer to uh, what other scholars have discussed about uh, the contribution and the limitation of early 20th century universalism in Western philosophy. So I read uh, other scholar's books. I don't know if you read. One is J.J. Um, Clark, the famous uh, Oriental Enlightenment. Then he compares uh, you know, Western philosophy and non-Western philosophy. So he put uh, three stages in this global philosophy. First stage is exactly what you talk about, universalism. But uh, he believed that universalism basically at the beginning was just uh, still a form of European American. So not to go beyond that. It's just to go beyond France, Germany, but I go to the whole European or North America. So that's the first universalism. If a few scholars in the States uh, start to bring in some non-Western, that's very few cases. And uh, basically universalism is using the free work of Western philosophy. So nothing really, as you mentioned, <laughs> open to other uh, things. That's the first one. Second is after World War II. Then uh, the bigger role play is American scholars start because World War II involved the Pacific War. So pay attention to more, more to uh, non-Western uh, philosophies. Then they bring in a kind of comparative philosophy. Comparative philosophy. But they believe that uh, by this Clark's work, still comparison based on Western free work, standard. You mentioned standard of the work. Until third stage, so called hermeneutical, is around the 80s and 90s. Then they focus on issue rather than one uh, country's philosophy, then try to interpret it. Then Western and non-Western can intermediate each other and bring different views under this issue. So I don't know if you agree. Later, uh, we see more books like uh, Peter Park talk about uh, racism in the formation of Western philosophical canon. Rowan yeah. has this book. Yeah, yeah, it's very good, but yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I oh, went... So, so you read yeah, 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 I know it. Yeah, it's very I good, just but... want, to you, want to ask you if you find some connection your talk with those views. No, no, absolutely. There were three very uh, interesting and uh, uh, remarks that I fully agree with you and how you read that book that there are another one from a French scholar that came out but it's not as good and clear as the one of Park. Um, okay, f uh, the, se the second step, yeah I think it's, um, 
in Hawaii, there was the first international congress of compared, uh, compared um, philosophy. And actually, at the beginning of this project, I was promising my wife to go and do archives in Hawaii, <laughs> paid, <laughs> just, just to find a justification. But I will not do it. I will spend better the money than going to Hawaii. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's difficult to find a better way, but let's say the more more scientific. Uh, so it's it's you're you're absolutely right, um, and it's true that uh, it's not only the universal that is nationalized, but is the universal that is European Europeanized. The idea of Europe as well is something very weird. Now Ukraine is the center of Europe. Uh, I don't know, it's like, like the, the frontiers are shifting according to the moment. But of course, I will go even further. Um, and, and my colleagues are not agreeing with me. And they look like I'm crazy because I'm like actually a self-hating philosopher. And I always say that philosophy is something uh, uh, European, but especially French and European, it's a creation of the 19th century. So it means that the term philosophy in Europe, uh, <coughs> a term that existed as well in Arab, uh, but meant knowledge. Uh, it's not this, uh, sorry for you, it's not this mumbo jumbo of big concepts of being and the other and so on that we are acquainted with during the 17th centuries, uh, the 17th and 18th century with the encyclopedias, with the Enlightenment. And no, uh, philosophy was knowledge, and the philosopher was a natural philosopher, a biological philosopher, and the philosophy is something that meant knowledge. And then they invented something strange in Germany, especially with Kant and then with this tradition that there's this weird kind of discourse that is transcendental, so it's not empirical, is not simply math and logic, it's something else, and that's philosophy. And then they invented something new that did not exist, we had been speaking about that, which is history of philosophy. The idea of history of philosophy did not exist before the beginning of the 19th century. You had collections in which people were speaking about the lives of the philosophers. So, the life of the sects, as they were saying. So the, 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 the story of the Epicureans, what they wrote, and so on and so forth. But the idea of <coughs> finding both a continuity from Heraclitus to, uh, let's say, Schelling at that time, it's a creation that happens in Germany. It's a, we would say, a montage. It's something weird. Uh, that I'm not saying that it's false. This is mainly false. This is done under the umbrella of this discourse called transcendental discourse, the Kantian discourse that tries to find some kind of common elements in uh, the philosophy of Plato, I mean, on the writings of Plato, in the writings of Descartes, in the writings of Pascal, whereas all these dudes were uh, doing completely different things, had completely other occupations. And so the, even the, uh, the idea of, uh, I al was always very, okay, how to put it? The idea of uh, 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 creating, creating or speaking so about something of, called non-European philosophy is part of this montage. Because uh, except uh, people that are very going to the text, they, they don't see how the text were uh, what the texts were aiming to in different places of the world. As well, many commentators of Aristotle, uh, Epicurus, or whatever, or the father of the church, they don't inscribe the texts in the context. And so they just take the concepts, they compare the concepts, and they say, this is philosophy. We have philosophy from the Middle Ages, we have philosophy from uh, uh, the Roman period, we have philosophy uh, from modernity, we have Chinese philosophy, and it's full of stereotypes. So uh, it's it, the, the three phases of, that you describe, it's as well phases of the discussions and the uh, auto-critique of this strange thing called philosophy, which is a European modern thing that tries to question itself without often without not being able to see things clearly, in my opinion. Very pretentious. But. Thank you.
Like, Very rich answer. <laughs> I'm just, oh, I'm taking this because we have an, a question from online that I think will actually dovetail with this a little bit. Um, so Amjal asks, um, during this time, do we see a distinction between philosophy and religion in certain European cultures? Um, in East and South Asia, we really don't see this kind of distinction. So he wants to know if you can say something about how that distinction is operating yeah. in your period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, as well, very, very good and interesting question. And I, of course, I'm ignorant about what was going on in South Asia at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but of course, there's a distinction. What, what is interesting as well in the uh, statistic or let's say quantitative uh, aspect of the research that is still going on is to see um, who were the people speaking, not only sex, gender, uh, city, country, age as well. It's very important and will bring out uh, new, new inf useful information. Um, but as well, uh, uh, what kind of position they, they, they occupied. So if they were teaching in chairs called philosophy, is there philosophy, blah, 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 or in, for instance, in religious, uh, they were often religious, or they were part of the neo Thomistic movement that was very important. So it was the church at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. They wanted to promote uh, philosophical discussion, but controlled, of course, by the Catholic Church, under the umbrella of the system of uh, Thomas, uh, uh, St. Thomas. And so there's a big, big nature that develops that had been studied recently by a colleague of mine that I don't recall the name of, but like a very huge network of scholars of this uh, Catholic neo thomistic movement that uh, uh, organized as well congresses that are parallel. So there was this difference. There was history of religion, philosophy of religion, and blah, 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 but there was uh, separation. So uh, the question's still forming in my head a little bit, but I was very intrigued, like the point you made about the sort of Kant, Hegel, that forms this sort of core, and then you look back and retroactively you grab a bunch of people from, or parts of what they did from the history of philosophy, and you say that's, or you say that is philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's sort of you retroactively form a discipline. So I think that's a really neat point. Uh, but then what's also weird is right around early 1900s, us looking back at that moment, we start to see things fracturing a little bit because Hegel and the Neo-Kantians were a kind of common core that everyone could talk about, at least in European philosophy. Uh, and then it starts to break up, and you start to get, you know, uh, the Vienna Circle and the British philosophers, and then, it, and we start to see the sort of fragmentation that we still have to fight with today, right? Uh, so I, I'm curious. It's the same time. It's that that's happening. I mean, they didn't know it at the moment, but that's we now look back and see everything splitting apart, and it's the exact moment when they're having these congresses where they're trying to yeah. bring everyone together. I'm just sort of fascinated by that tension, and I was yeah. curious if you could say more about it. Sure, sure. I, I, I think I have too, 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 too many, too many. I'm too curious and too many meat on the on the grill. Do you say that? <laughs> yeah. I want to do too much. Uh, but so the big guy um, in the so the first historian of philosophy, as the guy that collected all the. So I learned a lot, of course, reading stuff by other people, not only doing research during this year. So the, the first guy that was able to collect and find a kind of red line in between from Plato to until today was a guy called Brücke, the beginning of the 19th century. But the big guy that kind of did a history of philosophy um, in that sense of like finding common patterns and saying philosophy is not the same as religion, philosophy is not the same as the natural sciences, philosophy is not mathematics nor logic, is a guy called Tenenman. And uh, he uh, was part of the circle. There's a very nice article that people didn't read that I read very uh, lately by an uh, uh, American sociologist called uh, uh, Randall Collins that did a huge book of 100,000 uh, pages about the history of philosophy. This is not as good as the article, but the article is about the University of Vienna. The uh, University of Vienna, for some reason in Germany, during the last 20 years uh, of the 
uh, 18th century and the first end of the uh, uh, now the, the, the 18th and the first end of the 19th century was the center. So you had all these people passing through Jena, uh, all uh, fascinated by Kant, Schelling, Fichte, Hegel, uh, Schei Schleiermacher, uh, and this guy Tenenman. So it's like as from Jena it expanded to all the other uh, German states because of course Germany didn't exist; it was just a federation, and it was <coughs> exported. All around, and then, but then you have, and then we can come back to the uh, question of the of religion uh, of, of the other question uh, that was important insofar as most of these uh, states were Protestants, so you were allowed to say things that in a Catholic. Uh, uh, mostly Catholic country was complicated to say. So you have hermen hermeneutics, the free interpretation of the, of the uh, scriptures, of the holy texts, and so on and so forth. And then you have states that were mostly Catholic as friends, and then you have a long story of, uh, of the, during the 19th century of negotiation with the authorities and with the church. Italy, of course, and you had as well Austria and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then I come to, to the point in which it gets fractured. And during the <coughs> the 70, I think 70 years of existence of the Austrian Empire, the, the powers in place try to promote uh, an education and a production of knowledge that was, had uh, Catholicism as an umbrella, the rejection of the other heresies, free speech, but the rejection of the other her heresies, and a kind of ban of everything that was Kant, Schelling, Fichte, all the transcendental regime. And from this, paradoxically, he springs out uh, from the source, which is this guy called Franz Brentano, that was uh, as well the, one of the, the guys that inspired, bizarrely, uh, Heidegger, because he wrote on, on Aristotle. So the guy is really uh, the, uh, the paradigm of the uh, of, 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 of what was Austro-Hungary at that time. So he, he wrote on Aristotle, he was a priest, a Catholic priest that actually resigned. But at the same time, he was the promoter of empirical psychology. So uh, all this tradition through Mach until, until Schlick and all the, the, the members, the local members of the uh, Vienna Circle, they were springing out of this tradition in which transcendental, we don't give a damn, uh, religion, okay, but we don't go too much into it, and empirical research. So, for instance, the Philosophical Society of Berlin, that was a kind of a pre-cluster from uh, the birth of the Mark Mach circle, that was the Circle of Vienna, uh, it was a philosophical society in the sense the society for the production of knowledge. You had physicists, you had naturalists, you had psychologists, and you didn't have a lot of debates of, of this type of, uh, in which sense the transcendental logical logic is different from the formal logic. This was not very important. And what is strange as well, and I will end because I blab too much. Uh, so from Brentano, you have, uh, from Brentano springs out Husserl that is one thing, and Husserl at the beginning, he was not very worried about problems of looking too psychologistic or too empirical. It's when he goes to Germany and he has to confront with the neo-Kantians, they were saying, ah, you're a psychologistic, you're using empirical material to explain that, and so he has to. So the, the, the circulation ideas is as well this, is the fact that actually the producer knowledge, they move from a place to another and they have to confront with people, colleagues. And Frege too. Frege, Frege was uh, like widely anti psychologistical, yeah. And idealist, in a sense, different from Hegel. So the ideas were somewhere. somewhere. Okay, so concerning what you're saying with like philosophy originating mostly within like the 18th and 19th century. Um, and I forget, who would you say was the man who kind of found the bridge between like Plato and Kant, like that red line? Um, who's that, sorry? What, um, like th this kind of history of philosophy where it, um, 
originated from like say like Plato or yeah. Socrates and then made its way over to Kant and yeah. during that like I guess what you could say is kind of a dark age um, just was not existent or at least was in very small sects uh, in, in a way let's say that it's a process that it's uh it's slow and it's done by several people and several adjustments and as well uh, it's as well the transformation of the university that until the 19th century was not the place where knowledge was produced it was very it was just repeating knowledge the universities were just a this disastrous places, it was war in the academies. So things emerge slowly, and as well, as you, as you said, there's a kind of continuity that is imagined. But uh, by that, I don't mean that philosophy did not exist before. It's that um, the term uh, philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy, philosophy, whatever, uh, got different meaning according to the different periods, uh, so uh, it evolves with the ages. It evolves. It changes. So there are uh, not only evolution, but breaks completely. Bre but there are ruptures. Uh, I don't know if uh, some of you guys teach uh, this text uh, by Pierre Hadot that is often quoted. So Pierre Hadot, it's a historian of ancient ancient philosophy that Fou, the late Foucault quotes a lot, so Foucauldians love to quote Hado, but he's a very, despite of that, or on the side of that, he's a very good historian, I would say only historian, historian of philosophy, and in his books about ancient philosophy, he underlines the fact that what uh, the, the sects, the group in the antiquity were doing was something that dealt with doing something. So he has, as well, this kind of Wittgenstein uh, influence. So they were doing something. And so philosophy was not only writing text. It was all about a style of life, uh, what is the, not only what is the m meaning of life, but how can I get to that meaning of life? How should I organize my day? How should I meet my, my philosophical bodies and to, to, to cultivate uh, my practice every day. To have a certain mindset. Yeah, or a certain mindset, habits, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then comes modern philosophy that kind of sucks out only the concepts out of it. And Hado has a very, very nice, as well, very introductory, nice books in which he underlines to what extent ancient philosophy was especially a practice. Then you have the Middle Ages. Philosophy is just a, a kind of step to get to the absolute knowledge, which is theology, then you have modernity and you have empirical knowledge. And uh, so it's a kind of uh, buzzword that uh, got different meanings according to the ages. Now, concerning that, I want to say um, we see people well, like, say, Rene Descartes, Isaac Newton, they took heavy inspiration from not only like these ancient sources of philosophy, say like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, not the Greeks, but possibly from, the, I want to focus in on there's a type, people would say theology, people would call them the heresies, you know, uh, later dubbed like Gnostics, mm -hmm. who um, I'd say played a very heavy part in the distinguishment mm -hmm. between like, lo like, logical philosophy and religion and science but in between those things because say something like Valentinian philosophy or the Sethians, those guys, while they were theologians and therefore heresies by um, by like Irenaeus's mm -hmm. standards, um, they were focusing in on something they concerned themselves with elucidation and illusion between like these metaphysical things which you wouldn't really focus on that as a religion. Sure, they were called Gnostics and dubbed that way as a religion or a religious movement of the time. But in reality, it had very little to do with theology, one might mm. say. Mm. It's possible. I don't, don't know very well the, 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 the people that you quoted. But of course, there are like uh, subterranean or hidden sources uh, as well. Uh, to authors that we categorize as rationalist in the case of uh, Descartes, the, the, the f very first comparison 
uh, that comes to my mind uh, that you find in all the commentary of the meditations is that the structure of the meditations follows a little bit the structure of the um, the spiritual meditations that were part of the Jesuit training. So there was this guy, uh, Nyatsa de Loyola, that was promoted this. So the intertwining between either practices, religions, and knowledge was very fluid at that time, especially in times of tradition, er transition, early modernity, uh, Middle Ages, uh, and so on. Today it's more clear cut. The room. Um, so we have to obey the limits of the, the time that we have. So I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking Professor Bianco for a fascinating talk. And yeah, and also remind everyone. Let's do that. Please. Thank you for the attention, the questions, and the hospitality. You're very welcome.